and welcome to the International Center for Journalists Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum and our special event on covering climate change in 2021. My name is Jennifer Dora. I'm a senior program director at ICFJ. I'm also a journalist who is passionate about climate change coverage, so I'm excited to bring together a really incredible panel of reporters and editors for you today. They're exploring new and untold aspects of the climate change story, which I think is one of the most important that, that can be covered right now. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Imelda B. Abano has covered climate change, and biodiversity, and other environment-related issues for nearly two decades. She's the founder and president of the Philippine Network of Environmental Journalists. As a Philippines and Pacific Region Coordinator for Internews' Earth Journalism Network, she has helped train more than 5,000 journalists across the world. Presently, she is the contributing editor of Manga Bay Philippines and the editor of the Philippine Enviro News. David Calloway is an innovative global editor and media executive who, as editor-in-chief of USA Today, transitioned the newspaper into the fourth largest digital news group in the United States. He helped build early internet news pioneer CBS Market Watch as its top editor, and later he managed the turnaround and sale of The Street as its CEO. And this year, he founded Callaway Climate Insights, which explores the intersection of climate and finance in a daily newsletter, which he edits. We are also lucky to count him as a member of ICFJ's board of directors. And Gustavo Faleros, a journalist and media trainer who specializes in data driven journalism joins us as well. He is also a news innovator and a former ICFJ Knight Fellow, a fellow for life, uh, as we like to say, you're once a Knight Fellow, always one. Um, so that's a special part of ICFJ. In 2012, he launched Info Amazonia, a digital map that uses satellite and other publicly available data to monitor the Amazon rainforest, which um, he's been expanding that model and expanding Info Amazonia ever since and inspiring news startups in other countries to use the model and the code to build their own platforms to cover environmental issues like the health of the Nile River in Egypt and wildlife poaching in South Africa. He's also helped build training networks which have prepared journalists to report on the ground about the state of the forests and the environment in their communities. And most recently, he joined the Pulitzer Center as its first environmental investigations editor. Um, a quick reminder to the people tuning in, if you have questions during our discussion, please post them on the Zoom chat or in the comments of the Facebook live stream if you're joining us there. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're really thrilled to have all of you here. Um, I'd like to start by asking each of you to talk about climate change issues in your country or in your region? What are the biggest stories you and other journalists are covering now that are related to climate change? And how are you tackling those? And, and how's your news outlet tackling them? Amelda, let's start with you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, good morning, everyone, at least from my part of the world and good evening. Uh, most of you have probably seen the devastating impact of um, strong typhoons in the Philippines for the past few years, as shown in these slides. And the three strong typhoons in just three weeks, where most parts of the country were uh, flooded. Here in my hometown in the Philippines, as shown in this slide, this was taken early this week after a strong typhoon. Uh, there's so, so there's flooding all over. Here is another part of the Philippines last week. Um, next slide. Um, also flooded uh, due to another typhoon. And a week before that was another typhoon. So an average of 20 typhoons a year passes through the country. For, for a country literally at the doorstep of typhoons and natural disasters like this, um, the Philippines, a low-lying archipelago of more than um, a million people, is a perfect laboratory of stories to humanize the impact of, um, of climate change. And I think that also goes with uh, most countries in Asia and the Pacific region. With, with the country's vulnerability, the media is now slowly paying attention to um, reporting climate change and its related issues. So some still struggle to place climate related stories until after um, extreme weather events such as this. But as mentioned, we are seeing a fundamental shift in, um, in newsworthiness of climate, uh, climate change. Well, of course, as you know, as a new subject, 
it is deemed complex, as we know. Um, it requires a basic understanding of, uh, of science and its technical aspect would relate to a larger concerns of, uh, of the society. While we do not um, attribute every disaster to climate change per se, scientists say monsoon rains are being intensified by uh, rising sea surface uh, temperatures. So this is how we cover, uh, the media covers uh, climate change in the Philippines. It's an intersection of um, climate change and um, disasters. Gustavo, I wanted to ask you next if you could talk about the situation in Brazil. And we also would like to hear about your new Pulitzer Center gig. Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, ICFJ, for this invitation. Good evening, everyone. I'm speaking from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and here is 9 p.m. But it's a great pleasure being here with you, third place. Um, well, uh, I have to say that since last year, or since the past year, again, uh, the Amazon region, which is the, my primary uh, focus area where I'm doing my, my work, has become a really global story. And, and in a sense, it's very interesting to see how these uh, issues of deforestation uh, are now clearly related with climate change. So turning this story into a global story. And so since uh, last year, because of the, the great um, uh, event of forest fires we had in the Amazon, we saw um, an interesting aspect, an interesting trend in the in the media of doing exactly what I said to relate uh, the forestation and the problems of the Amazon with the global climate. And so this is the narrative going on now, and the story is pretty much um, in a um, higher sphere, which I mean, like it's it's involved with, for example, with the trade agreement between uh, the Mercosur and um, European Union or mentioned during the um, American elections, you know, so the politics of Brazil is pretty much uh, responding as well to this kind of a uh, <clears throat> worldwide discussion about the future of the Amazon. So the story that journalists are trying to cover here is both domestically trying to show the impacts of this um, global diplomacy on the uh, domestic politics and also looking at the global level or then on the possible, <clears throat> you know, problems that Brazil might face on, for example, international markets or even now international politics. I want to remember again that the, the new elected, the elected president of the U.S., Joe Biden, has uh, mentioned you know, the Amazon region is one of those primary areas he wants to focus and discuss on the climate change. So I think the story is already there, you know, like the main story right now, the climate story, in my opinion, it's related to those recent events. And I think um, already talking a little bit about this new role of the, the Pulitzer Center, I think the story is becoming much more complex, you know, in a sense that um, we'll need a, a journalist, in-depth journalist to understand the complexities that what are the real drivers of the first station and how this again linked to climate change. And that's what we're trying to do with this uh, rainforest investigative network, um, investigations network that the Pulitzer Center just launched. And I'm <clears throat> having the honor of coordinate. It's going to be a, a cohort of 10 journalists, investigative journalists working for a year with fellowships to try to uncover some issues of like human rights abuse, uh, climate change again, or uh, corruption and governance involving in the three uh, main tropical rainforest regions of the planet, the Amazon, Congo, and Southeast Asia. So I'm excited to be working with that. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds really important and a good, uh, it's deepening and continuing the work you've been doing, which is fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so Dave, could you tell us about Callaway Climate Insights? Um, you have very deep experience as a journalist, as an editor, and, 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 and in business also, but covering business has been your beat. And I'm wondering why, uh, how it was that you decided climate change is the business story that you're going to devote your time to. Well, sure, Jennifer. And uh, hello, everybody from just outside 
uh, San Francisco. Uh, and thank you again to ICFJ for, for throwing this panel uh, for, our, for our readers and for everybody. Um, I, you know, I think the um, biggest story to get to your first question right now in the US is obviously the Biden transition. We've had four years of a US president who not only hasn't helped with the climate change uh, battle for solutions, but who has actively uh, hindered it, uh, who has promoted the, uh, the fossil fuel companies, who has set back regulations put in by his predecessor, Obama, uh, to help us uh, move towards a, a clean energy future. And so what Biden's opportunity is in the next couple of years, how he can work with Congress or not, uh, uh, to, uh, to enable uh, 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 solutions in the US, how he will work with other uh, leaders of the world, the free world uh, in Europe. Um, the Amazon, obviously a, a huge story um, for anybody that cares about climate change. The uh, stuff, stuff that's happening there is impacting all of us. We've seen uh, this terrible storm, uh, largest hurricane of the year, uh, in this uh, in this area of the world, hit uh, in uh, Nicaragua and uh, Honduras this past week. You know those people in those countries have done absolutely nothing to cause uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that are leading to climate change, and they are being wiped out. It certainly is a global story, but in the U.S., it's that transition. And then to get to your more your latter point, Jennifer, um, there is there's a lot that's been happening in the U.S. and in world financial centers in the last couple of years. A massive wall of money, literally trillions of dollars, is being raised and started to be deployed towards climate solutions as the world becomes more familiar with them. In some areas, like in the Philippines and the Amazon, it's been a longstanding problem. In other places, like in the US, because of our political situation, not many people are really ed that educated on it. Anyway, this massive wall of money, trillions of dollars, is being raised and deployed by essentially banks and asset managers and governments in the form of, of subsidies. And they're looking for solutions. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are doing fascinating things to clean up plastics in the ocean and remove carbon from the soil and remove carbon from the air um, to, to combat against sea rises, uh, destroying some of our, our coastal cities. Uh, and so my reasoning for starting Callaway Climate Insights really was, I, I've seen this disconnect between this great journalism that's being done on the environmental side and lack of education and, uh, on, the, on the financial side and a, lack, and a disconnect between the money that's being raised and the entrepreneurs who need it to create solutions. So I think uh, um, you know, climate change journalism uh, uh, environmental journalism has been around forever. Some of the greatest journalists in the world are doing it. Uh, but climate change journalism in the mainstream media, particularly in the business press, uh, is relatively early stage. And, and there's a lot of opportunities. A lot of young journalists want to get into that side of the business. And, uh, and I thought it would be good to, uh, to spend the next several years of my life and my career kind of on this story, <laughs> which I think once we... Uh, uh, conquer COVID uh, will become uh, the main story for, for decades to come. And, and I believe that the top new journalists to come, uh, come on board globally are going to be focused on environmental and climate journalism. Wow, that's great. Thank you. I, Gustavo, I saw you nodding um, about when uh, Dave was talking about the business aspects and how it's not covered enough. Is, and I know you also started your career in a business, at a business publication in Brazil. So I was wondering kind of what, what you see. No, no, it's totally, I, I, well, maybe I'm biased, but I'm totally agreeing with Dave. It's like, I, I do think it's, it's, he does that. This is the story of the, of the centuries. It's just because it touches everything. It's the final, you know, transversal challenge that we have, you know, like it's everywhere. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's literally a big story in the, in a sense that it's huge scale temporally and it needs to be covered over years and, and in a vast geographical scope as well. So in that sense, I agree a lot. But I, on the financial aspect of journalism, I'm, I have to say two things. First, I, I, I start to love environmental journalists working for a financial newspaper. It was there that I realized that this is 
wow, this is super story, you know, like banks creating ways of dealing with climate change. Of course, the financial sector, not the financial journalists, has envisioned the problems of climate change much earlier because they are taking all the precautions, right? Like the, the insurance companies and things, they know what's happening very well. And so at that moment, beginning of the 2000s, I saw these guys preparing for something big. And that's how I, I learned a lot of like, you know, discussion about energy and sanitation and water. It was really a, a big learning working for a financial newspaper. But on the other hand, I also learned that there's, if there's one um, journalist, kind of journalist that is very partisan and takes a side, this is the financial journalist because they're pro environment, I'm sorry, pro economic growth. They don't question if it's growing with uh, fossil fuels. At that point, they did. That's why I agree also with uh, David that's in early stages. It would just now they're saying like, well, there's a new hydroelectric power plant. Maybe there is some issues that we should consider that are not so good as as building a, a you know a new hydroelectric power plant in a sense that they, they were supporting any kind of investment without questioning the environmental impacts. And so I think the financial journalists, it's uh, it's the way of I think uh, dealing with the issue with a much more clear way. So if the financial journalist improves the coverage of climate, I agree, the, the overall communications of the problem is going to be much better. That's my point. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Gustavo. And, and um, you know, the pursuit of growth has been the basis for financial companies you know, forever. Uh, and and they, they're the ones that have uh, essentially invested and supported the fossil fuel companies uh, through the decades of, of causing climate damage. You know, I think a lot of the, the disconnect that we've seen in the recent uh, years um, with some with denial of climate change and, and movements, uh, people you know, saying that it's not gonna impact them, is people really not understanding uh, what's going on or people treating it when they're told that they're gonna have to you know, not eat meat or move you know, to, to a different part of the country, treating it as a punishment. Now, I think, with a lot of the one money coming in, the, the search for climate change solutions is going to soon become an opportunity uh, for lots of people, for investors, for, for, uh, for large uh, uh, financial companies and stuff beyond the insurance companies. And when it becomes an opportunity, you can get your growth and save the world at the same time uh, you know, with some of these bigger uh, solutions that we're talking about. So that's why you know I think governments it's going to be difficult for governments to mandate cleaning up the world and saving the world. It's just, it mm. just, they're going to need help and, and creating financial markets and financial incentives for investing in climate solutions can only be part of that help. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So um, as you've been ramping up with the, the newsletter and, the site, uh, have you, uh, it occurs to me, what are some of your kind of, uh, how did you prepare to really cover this issue from a business perspective? And, and I'm, because I'm thinking about how people who are covering this issue for the first time, like a reporter who's new to it, how can they make sure that they're bringing the business, that they're investigating it properly? Well, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, the first thing you learn um, is that the learning curve is huge, uh, very steep, um, and that climate change, environmental coverage, you know, could, you can, entire news organizations are devoted to it. There could be dozens of beats, um, you know, from agricultural to, to ocean tech, to, to policy, to, um, to, to just financial. And so, you know, I think, as, as a reporter, as a journalist covering it, you kind of need to choose your areas. Otherwise, you can just drown in the, in the really the global size of the, of the problem. Um, and so my area I chose to focus on was, was the environmental, social, and governments area, the so-called ESG area, where a lot of that money is being raised. Um, you know, that really is in its infancy and is just marred by lack of good information, lack of good data and metrics, and, and frankly, um, um, sensationalistic marketing um, that is, that is going to end up hurting folks uh, who are probably you know, feeling like they want to put their money towards, towards some good use. So there's a lot kind of just in that bucket 
which I've been <laughs> focused on. But um, because um, you know of my uh, um, connection with ICFJ and some of my other jobs in the past, I, I'm privileged to have a lot of friends in international journalism around the world. And so they're working with me uh, on various uh, other capacities, such as policy in Europe, um, um, policy in, uh, in Asia, and kind of some of, the, some of the things that can wrap into making it more of a global story. And so one of the things we're trying to do on the newsletter is, is you know, synthesize all of the information that's happening every day down to um, you know, the 10, the dozen or two dozen really interesting need to know stories from somebody kind of at the, at the international level. That's, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Um, I was going to ask, you guys have touched on this a little bit already, but I wanted to ask sort of gl globally and also where you are, um, how would you characterize the state of climate change reporting? Is there enough of it? Is there enough high quality reporting? And do you think the reporting is reaching the people who need it? Um, Melda, would you like to, to um, start? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we have to admit that stories have had to compete with uh, political and sensational crime and um, corruption stories that take top news priority. Um, that is true not just in the Philippines or in Asia and uh, the Pacific, but elsewhere, even in Brazil and the U.S. So we have to find um, ways to make climate change sexy and bring down the science to a level that can um, be easily explained on television or radio using local language. Um, while reports, I think, increase significantly only when there are um, disasters such as in the Philippines, I would not say that there is a poor um, coverage. Although environmental advocates would uh, probably look forward to a time when climate change becomes a regular fair in our newspapers or broadcast news the way there are regular sections for um, sports or even show business. But then over the years, um, I think major reports have started to uh, put more focus on government uh, policies in terms of um, management or funding for agencies at the forefront of, um, of climate change or disaster management. Um, they are starting to read uh, research reports based on available uh, materials and um, sor sources. And I, I think discussing this issue in the media in, is an educational process as well. And of course, the training that most journalists received in um, strengthening their climate change reporting is a big boost for them to increase the quality and quantity of their reporting. I, I, just if I could just jump in, I think that's a great point, Amel, the discussion of it in the media, like these types of webinars, really it will help it become more mainstream in the media. Um, right. It is, you know, it, it's like I said, environmental reporting has been around for, for a long time. Some of the greatest journalists in the world have, have done it and are doing it. Uh, but as it becomes more mainstream, as the public and the world um, begins to start to realize what's at stake, um, be educated at that, you're going to see more and more media, more and more journalists want to do that type of coverage and more and more news companies little newsletters like mine or big news companies like the Washington Post or the Guardian um, dedicate significant resources to doing it. Um, and, and that can only help. I, you know, part of the problem with climate change is it's, it's always been billed as something that's gonna happen in the future. Uh, and so mm -hmm. people understand that, but they've got more urgent priorities. And we saw with the way COVID came and you know, took over the world in, in literally two weeks this past spring, that when your very lives are threatened, people start to pay attention. Uh, you know, climate journalists, in my you know, opinion, have not been able to convey that threat um, in quite the same way as COVID conveyed it. Uh, and that is starting to change. And the more media coverage we get on it, the more people will start to realize what a threat it is, what an immigration story it is, what a, what a um, you know, what a poison story it is, what a, what a pollution story it is. I'm, I'm also agreeing with this point of view that it's a, it, it's a good moment. It's a, maybe a turning point in, in climate reporting. Um, 
it's definitely has evolved a lot, but I think the, the COVID itself it will present a turning point in, in many things, but I think on the realization for journalism that science is really an area to focus in a sense that journalists are preparing themselves to cover COVID because they have to, you know, like read papers and articles and never, so many scientific articles were published in such a short time of period, you know, so they have to engage with this kind of language and, uh, you know, ethics, science, scientific ethics. And I think that will bring a lot for the climate reporting in a sense that for me, the best climate reporting done so far are the ones where, you know, deep in science reading and interviewing science and trying to bring the, the complexity of the issue to the audiences. And I think that we'll, are, are we going to have a, we're going to have a much more, a, a bigger group of prepared people to deal with the science of climate change right now. That's my, my hope. Yeah, I think you're right. COVID's gonna, it's gonna help a lot in that aspect. I mean, we all know more than we ever wanted to know about how vaccines work, <laughs> right? Because we've been, as reading that voraciously over the last couple of days, and and uh, and soon we'll all know more a lot about how uh, uh, some of these climate solutions are working. Zoonosis were was a big story. I don't know, maybe yeah. yeah. For Imelda, pretty sure it was a big story as well. Zoonosis, right in the beginning of the pandemic, we all jump into like, what's the relation between forest deforestation and COVID? Tell yeah, us exactly. <laughs> and wildlife trafficking. Wildlife trafficking. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Would you talk about some of your story, your stories that you did early in the pandemic about that? Yeah. Do you want to start, Melda, and then I can talk. Yeah, we have, we've done a lot of stories on um, on wildlife trafficking and um, COVID nineteen um, uh, um, discussions, and of course on climate change. So um, we have uh, published a series of, of stories on that as well as um, it's, of course, it, in the Philippines, it's, it, it's still in the relationship of um, disaster and um, climate change. Uh, me, well, just in the right, uh, right in the beginning of the pandemic, I, I, I was lucky to be in touch with um, David Quammen. And so I did an interview, which was a great start of the coverage. I don't know if everybody knows David Quammen, it's a great National Geographic writer. Um, not just National Geographic, he's a writer with many books published and one of his books is called Spillover, which look at the case of Ebola and many other cases of a virus that were coming out of um, wildlife. So I interviewed him and, and from this interview already, we started doing a coverage in Info Amazonia, I'm speaking on different aspects. So my colleague, the editor of Info Amazonia, Juliana Mori, she did a great work on creating a monitor of COVID in the Amazon and now this were affecting the indigenous people of, of the Amazon and, and the, those were great stories with maps showing the distance of the hospital facilities of indigenous territories. That was a, a nice a way of visualizing the difficulties and then automated um, updates on, on deaths and cases and, and the Amazon region uh, states. And so that was uh, the work we did, some data trying to monitor. And just one more thing that I, I'm really proud of. Uh, one um, colleague, a friend actually uh, reached out. He's an anthropologist from the university and offered a partnership for indigenous people to tell their uh, view and their stories, really uh, personal stories during the pandemic. So there, was, there were a lot of touching stories about uh, the meaning of this virus and indigenous cultures and how it was affecting, you know, cultural aspects of their uh, social and cultural organization. So it was really interesting to have like 15 reports with 15 uh, personal stories in Info Amazonia about this moment for the indigenous peoples. Yeah, we had, uh, we started Callaway Climate Insights in uh, the second week of March. Um, literally the week that the lockdowns began. Um, and, and I remember we had a whole list of stories that we we're gonna publish in the inaugural issue. And I remember thinking, you know, we should probably have something about COVID um, because it might be around for a few weeks or a month. And, uh, you know, we, sh we should nod to the fact that this is the, the global story right now. Uh, and, you know, and little did I know over the next several weeks, that was pretty much all we were writing about was COVID and climate change, climate change, COVID, the deforestation, the wildlife trafficking, 
the uh, dramatic decline in pollution above China uh, and many industrial cities uh, in Eastern Europe and, and in, in South America caused by uh, everybody staying at home and sheltering in place. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a fabulous story and the two remain intertwined as, as twin threats. Um, and frankly, from a financial and economic perspective, um, you know, one of the big stories of the next year is going to be the global recovery from COVID and whether it is actually a green recovery, uh, given some of the cost okay. dynamics that are going to be in place and thought about at the various uh, government levels. Right. Um, and a, a moment ago, a couple of minutes ago, one of you mentioned the idea of making the connection for for audiences and communities that this is happening now as opposed to this is something way off into the future. And um, I, I'm wondering how you guys think journalists can do that better. Um, you know, because they're like, yeah, Imelda, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the good news is that we are seeing more and more journalists wanting to to learn the ropes of writing climate-related stories, um, adding, of course, innovative tools such as uh, mobile reporting, use of drones, um, mapping, infographics, and simulations in their reporting. Um, we, we have established in the Philippines the Philippine Network of Environmental Journalists in 2010. Now we have more or or less uh, 300 members. If if uh, if I may, for the past few years. Um, and Gustavo knows this very well because he started um, um, data journalism, geojournalism in, uh, in the Internews, Internews Earth Journalism Network. It's an international media development um, organization. We have been conducting training for journalists in the developing countries. Um, now already more than um, 10,000 since 2004, I think, to cover widely variety of um, issues, uh, helps develop, uh, innovative online environmental news sites, and we produce content of local media, including groundbreaking um, uh, investigative reports. Um, as Gustavo, you know, the Earth Journalism Network also helps um, establish networks of environmental journalists in countries where they don't exist and build their um, capacity where they do. So we do these uh, through workshops, and the development of training materials and by offering fellows, fellowship programs, grants to uh, media organizations, sorry about that, um, story stipends and support for um, story production and uh, distribution. So I think uh, we're, we're doing a lot better now compared to um, coverage before. Oh, yeah, great. I think it's... Uh... Um, really, the specialty that Gustavo has developed is is the specialty that journalists are going to need going forward to really cover the climate threat, and that is data. Specialty, um, mm. there's 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 almost too much data, and at the same time, not enough data. Um, uh, the, the types of data that that people might want to see, which are who are the big polluters, how are their footprints changing on a regular basis. Um, you know, needs to be in you know, com, you know, reported on in a much more robust way, uh, along with the vast reams of scientific data. And so the journalists, I think, I'm my hand to Gustavo now, um, you know, who can who can work with data and work with AI, um, really are going to be at the forefront of of climate reporting in the in the next couple of years. Which really are the you know are are the most important years. We we're hitting a tipping point where there's going to be no going back if we haven't already hit it. So how that's that's a great point about the data. I'm wondering how do we make the data real for people in the moment so they realize it has to happen now. That change that change has to happen. Um. You mentioned, uh, Jennifer, I think the issue of connection, and I, I, I truly think this is the main challenge uh, for us journalists because things are connected. You know, like when David was saying, like the forest, the forestation affects all of us. Okay, he understands that. Probably he read and, and, and learned by doing stories, but not everybody knows 
that this is real, you know, that the connection is real and climate is about that. Or it's just one planet connected by one climate that cannot be <laughs> broken, uh, broken, right? And so I think that explaining the connection goes that way of using a lot of, of visuals because it's explaining the science of, for example, how cutting trees in the Amazon reduce the first uh, reduce rainfall in the producing areas of soybeans of Brazil. This is a concrete thing. It's happening, and we're not even talking about climate uh, per se. I mean, it's microclimate in a sense, regional climate. That if you cut trees in one region, you reduce uh, moisture, and then there's no rain for producing soy. So this is already a discussion that I think it's very. Um, instrumental in a sense in Brazil that is happening because people are seeing this, you know, like maybe droughts that can be already related uh, by uh, by science to some of those uh, environmental degradation. And I think the same thing will happen with climate. If the science of attribution, which is attributing, um, you know, some climate um, uh, issues, climate change um, attribution of uh, disasters like the ones uh, now that we're saying, I think people will really connect that something needs to be done. So explaining this connection with a lot of science and data is definitely the way forward. Yeah, and, and using that data to show people how it affects them. Um, when you think about, um, you know, the, the, if we could, we could cut all of our global emissions, say, you know, every car, fossil fuel car stops tomorrow and nobody's flying and, and but, you know, we cut all those global, you know, 50%, right? Um, there's still too much carbon in the atmosphere. It needs to be reduced. What reduces it? Trees. Where's the biggest reduction? Carbon sink, as they say, the Amazon and the Amazon's burning. Um, you know, people need to understand what, what exactly the Amazon burning means to them. And, and if you live in the Southwest or the Southeast of the United States, it might mean that you're gonna have to move in the next 15 years. Um, and people, you know, they, I don't think they quite get that, that connection and journalists need, I, I think Gustavo was right, visuals and data to support that connection and really drive home what's at stake for people. I, I wanna maybe bring a question following this idea, David, I think, uh, on the political aspect of the of this issue, the, the politicians of various um, colors, so to speak, I mean, like various uh, flags and ideologies, they understand this issue very well. That's why I, I think we're seeing this tension, international tension, when the president of Brazil, for example, says like he doesn't want interference because I think he understood that the world is concerned about that. So it's very it's a very, again, instrumental discourse say like, no, this is ours. We take care because I think it's already in a sphere that it's not about one nation is the owner of this. It's a global balance. That's as David was saying, the global balance of carbon. Sh should we collaborate? Should we go back to the Paris Agreement? I think this is the discussion right now. It's, there's no way of doing this alone. <laughs> no walls are going to stop coming. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so if you are thinking about coverage in general, like what do you think is needed in terms of like, what are the barriers to getting more coverage and, and making sure that there's really high quality coverage that is reaching people? And, and then what do you think I guess, what are the areas also where we think that we need new solutions or new technology to help with that or new innovations? It doesn't even have to be technology. Well, I, I think, um, you know, the, the coverage is going to come as the story becomes bigger. Uh, the, the, the bigger the story is, it, Biden has been spending this week talking to world leaders. The only thing they're talking about is climate change. Um, the, you know, the, the, as, as that story becomes more and more prevalent as it gets, as it's on the front page of every, uh, newspaper and website and television screen, um, journalists are going to want to cover it. Journalists kind of tend to follow the big story and, uh, and they're going to want to cover it. And so we're going to see that, but, you know, barriers to coverage, obviously, like I said, understanding data, um, understanding things like AI and how that works, understanding what is real and what is hype 
there's a, you know, this is new to me as I've been covering this, but there's, there's a lot of hype out there um, on stuff that's not going to happen on solutions that aren't going to be, you know, financially or, or scientifically successful. Um, and journalists, like they always have to do, need to be skeptical and, and, <laughs> and check the facts. And so there's, there's a lot going on. But in terms of innovations, um, you know, I think innovations like, uh, um, like they're doing with, uh, uh, in the Amazon, with the Amazon mapping and using data and stuff, really will help journalists explain that type of thing. Um, innovations uh, in in all sorts of other industries um, that that move the climate solution story forward, journalists will be able to adapt those, and 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 that will help them cover it. Should I have a point? Yeah, I think in terms of coverage, there's um, what I see. There will be opportunities. Um, like the opportunities that are, for example, now on, on the client, on the weather forecast. I, I should mention, for example, here in Brazil, the global, which is the biggest uh, TV network of South America, if not of Latin America, they're doing great work, we should say. Um, you know, like just bringing issues to the weather forecast sometimes, you know, and mixing up with in that reporting, for example, about the huge fires that we have in Pantanal. You might have seen like this different biome of Brazil, which was burning for months nonstop, worst drought ever recorded, you know, since 19, I don't know what. And so the coverage was really focused on science, climate change, and giving voice to some scientists that are already having evidence and can attribute this phenomenon to climate change, because this is always the issue. The, sci the scientists will be very conservative in a sense, say like, well, I can't say this is climate change. But as there's evidence, more and more evidence, you start finding journalists that are talking. So there's opportunities of bringing this, you know, again, science to a trivial thing. It was like a weather report. That's one uh, thing that I would like to mention as an example of like, uh, as again, David was saying, there's opportunities that might come with, I don't know, sport reporting, who knows, an event that cannot happen because of climate change or any, any reporting is an opportunity as long as the event asks for this kind of, of information. But the other opportunities in terms of innovation I would like to mention, we see, again, a lot of, of uh, AI happening in journalism. So the elections, a lot of outlets were producing stories with AI, automated stories about the results. This happened in the election for mayors here. And so this kind of alerts, stories as alerts, automated alerts, are already happening in various fields and it's considered journalism. Like you receive a SMS with a short story that is generated by a robot. So this kind of service in a sense of distributing information about maybe you should leave your home in the next four hours, otherwise it's gonna be flooded, can be provided by journalism as whether forecasts were provided by journalists or like fire forecasts will be provided by journalists with some kind of level of editorial uh, uh, management behind. And that's the interesting thing. You edit the robots. I think that's the real innovation. Like I want this robot to give information every hour about this with this specific editorial cut. And that I think it's a very good way of, of dealing up with some of the issues because a lot of this data can be automated, like forest alert, uh, forest fire alerts, other kinds of alerts like flooding alerts, uh, weather alerts, you know, like don't go out as a uh, 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 civil defense actually does already, you know. So, but I see some of this information can be automated and distributed by journalism outlets. That's what I see. Yeah, and Imelda does good. this, actually. Sorry, Imelda has done this with SMS, right? Yeah. Imelda? I was just gonna say, we, um, we you know, here in, uh, in California, you know, we all became adept at, uh, at checking the alerts on air quality this summer during the wildfires, right? Uh, and all became experts on air quality. And and for a, for a few weeks there, we had the worst air in the world, worse than Beijing, worse than New Delhi, and and everybody knew it. And that was because of the alerts. It wasn't because of of anything else. And it was it it helped educate uh, the people on that. And and just lastly, Gustavo, to your sports uh, analogy, 
I did a story recently. There, there have been more American football games canceled in the last two years because of oh, wow. hurricanes and storms than ever before. And it's a direct impact on climate change. Also, you know, the whole, we didn't really get into the whole racial and minority discussion and poor communities and how they're impacted worse by climate change. But that is a big story in, in America uh, that's being adapted by professional athletes, basketball players in particular, who's speaking out uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement uh, on that aspect. So it's touching everything. Yeah, and that's been true around the world. And um, yeah, it's it's it resonates so strongly in the U.S. right now, and it's, we're seeing that for the first time. I think that anyone of that level, um, in terms of a public persona, coming out and talking about that. Sorry, Imelda, did you want to say? No, I was just. I, I just want to say that um, um, in terms of barriers. I think it's still um, um, strengthening the capacity or the skill of journalists in um, understanding climate change issues. Because if you yourself cannot understand the, the issue, and then how about your audience? You know. Uh, so I, and and I think it's um, the space in terms of a space in the newspapers or uh, in the broadcast or radio space. Um, Still, for now, it's being um, dominated by uh, politics or show business um, mm -hmm. issues. So, and um, and one thing is the resources for journalists to cover those um, uh, those issues on the ground. You muted. So, sorry, yep, I did for just a sec. So yeah, we're, I wanted to talk, um, Dave started to talk about this a little bit earlier about as you look ahead to 2021, what are the stories that you think reporters should be ready to cover? And um, I'm, I'm guessing you've talked about COVID a little bit. I'm guessing that will continue to be a piece of it connected to um, climate change, but um, just wanted to find out what you what you think the big stories will be and what will you be looking for? Um, well, you know, obviously I said the COVID recovery story and whether it is indeed a green recovery, whether you're in uh, uh, Latin America or Europe or uh, Asia or the US, you know, how these economies are recreate themselves and reinvent themselves. And if they take the opportunity to do it in a green way, some will, some won't. Globally, we largely missed that opportunity uh, 10 years ago during the great financial crisis. Um, and I think we learned a lesson and I think there will be much more of a green recovery. But the other story, you know, I think is um, uh, at least in the U.S., the, you know, the, the essentially the the arms race between the US and China to reduce emissions, both with Biden now in charge in the US, kind of, and, uh, and uh, you know, Xi Jinping in China pledging to reduce emissions to 2050, maybe. Um, you know, between the two of them, they represent something like 42% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So if they actually could find ways to cooperate or at least compete, um, that is a massive story and something that's going to play out well in 2021. Um, you know, for my readers, it's again the, the whole ESG, environmental social government movement that's coming up. And, and, and then the final one I would say is, um, is, I referenced it earlier, is it's not enough that the world cuts its emissions. We have to find technologies that pull carbon from the atmosphere. They are there, but not in great scale. And that, I think, you're gonna to start to see that become much more and more of an important subject of discussion in the media next year. Thank you, that's great. Imelda? Um, so, so with the growing trend of um, more destructive climate related disasters, at least in my country, um, I think some of the stories that we are going to, to watch out for are um, uh, first is the displacement as a low-lying uh, island nation dominated by um, 
coastal communities, it is susceptible to um, tsunamis, sea level rise, and storm surge surges. Um, number two is the call for climate emergency. Um, environmental groups um, will continue to call for the establishment of a scientific and human rights body to lead the implementation of a climate emergency action plan in, in the country. Um, another thing is the coal moratorium in the Philippines. Just last month, the Philippine government declared a moratorium on new coal-fired uh, power plants in, in the Philippines. There are already around um, like 28, I think, coal-fired power plants currently operating throughout the country. And um, well, will the country transition away from fossil fuels and move towards renewable energy? Or is it a strong signal to call investors as well as um, financial institutions that uh, fossil fuels are losing proportions that we have to find out? Um, biodiversity, of course, will continue to be a key coverage area. Biodiversity loss and ecosystems destruction. Um, strengthening, of course, public infrastructure, um, declining farm yields and health issues traced to extreme weather, weather events. Um, also, climate change in the news, um, plastic pollution, water management, uh, poverty, and economic crisis, and, and of course, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to the environment. Um, <clears throat> in my opinion, I will focus on the um, um, following the idea that I think the Biden presidency will uh, change a lot of the discussion, not the least the solutions will to be seen, but the discussion in terms of like, what is the expectations to the meeting of Glasgow, for example, which is the next UN uh, summit that was canceled this year. I think it will take another level in importance. It's gonna become a story because an agreement can come out of this, of solutions and, and forests, which is my main area, it's definitely gonna be part of the discussion. So I think it's gonna be a big story for us covering it. Um, forest what's going to be the role of forest on the climate solution and that's going to bring a lot of tensions um so relating with a lot of what Imelda was saying and David about the social problems that are coming with this climate crisis you know like issues of adaptation the most vulnerable and related of course with the recovery or the, uh, or the length of this recovery who's going to suffer more I think we will see in this part of the world, in South America, a big story about the tensions that connect the destruction of forests and a lot of illegality. That's becoming a big story in terms of like all the gold mining that's happening right now in the Amazon is a very tense situation of actual security in the sense that you have areas of, of the Amazon dominated by criminal gangs. It might look like a small issue related to climate, but it means like, okay, that you have a global agreement, but you have like this off law <laughs> people out in the jungle, just destroying the jungle, who's going to deal with them, you know, yeah. talking about like dissident Colombian guerrilla supported by communists, you know, governments and, and, you know, having a, some very big political tension in the frontiers of Venezuela and Brazil, which definitely interests to, <laughs> to the U.S. I think will come into play and that's going to be part of the story it's more of a guess of something that can we can see in the news in 2021 that's a really good point and i think the um i should have mentioned but amelda did the 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 um coal um situation globally essentially the death of of the coal industry how quickly that might happen with some countries in Asia and the, U and the Eastern Europe still relying on it. Others not, you know, um, the fact that renewables are cheaper now than fossil fuels. How that plays out is going to happen pretty quickly in the next couple of years. It'll be a big story next year. Wow, that's a lot to cover for reporters this coming year. Um, we have a question and it um, it's about can Biden, can President Biden stop the drilling in Alaska once he is president? And that goes to a bigger question is of uh, what can Biden do because he wants to rejoin Paris and he can make a lot of changes in certain areas. But um, Dave, you had a very interesting column or post about this recently about what, you know, cooperation. 
Uh, yeah, in, in the column, I was essentially arguing that you know Biden can do a lot to undo Trump's, some of Trump's uh, uh, more damaging regulations. Uh, he can use issue a lot of executive orders. But if he really wants to make progress, if he really wants, you know, to have his, I said, the next couple of years are key for the world. If this Biden presidency, if he can gain the type of cooperation internationally, but also in Washington, that would allow him to make progress, I think, you know, it could be a historic, uh, a historic couple of years. And there are a lot of Republicans who favor climate change solutions and, you know, who have basically been keeping their mouths shut. And so I think there was a lot of opportunity, I was saying, in that. But, you know, as for things like Anwar, the, the drilling, the wildlife refugee, refuge in Alaska, um, you know, that's almost a bit of a sideshow to begin with. You know, the, the, there's no drilling now. Trump is trying to rush through the leases uh, so we can have them sold by the inauguration. You know, Biden can easily prevent, stop them once once that happens. And and frankly, you know, from the time you get the lease to the time you stick a drill in the ground is usually several years. It's very expensive to uh, to drill up in Alaska. I'm not even sure it's worth it to the oil companies uh, that would buy the leases now to want to dig in six or seven years. So, you know, that story, like the Keystone Pipeline in the U.S., has a long way to go, I think. That makes sense. So we're um, close to needing to wrap up, but uh, if anyone has anything else they'd like to add, there's still time. I'd, I'd like to ask Amelda a question. I, you know, I, I'm fascinated by what's going on over in Asia. And, you know, as you look out across the, the geopolitical spectrum there, you know, what do you think, you know, the most troublesome countries will be in the, in the world's um, impact, uh, uh, you know, goal to fight climate change? Well, it's, it's, it's still, um, for me, I think it's still uh, the developing countries, of course, the low-lying um, nations like the Philippines or um, small islands or atoll in the Pacific region um, were mostly um, affected by, um, well, sea level rise, of course, um, droughts, food shortage, and, and the like. And of course, the disasters that's coming along the way. So I think these countries are um, the most vulnerable ones, of course. But in terms of uh, the biggest polluters, um, China, obviously, um, Japan to some extent, I guess. Uh, you yes. know, do you who do you is that going to continue to be a, an issue, um, especially for the low lying countries? Yeah, yeah, of course. We're we're, we're looking well, well, China, of course, and India, and we're looking under Biden. We're looking that we will have. Um, more predictable, um, more deliberate U.S. government, a better partner internationally in most things like um, uh, climate change issues, one, um, looking at these vulnerable countries. And I, I think we need the U.S. To, to take a lead on climate change at the global level and to take it seriously. So we hope Biden administration administration to to join or to rejoin the Paris Agreement on climate change to address all these uh, concerns. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer you're muted again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to cough and drink water for a second, so I muted myself. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so uh, does, did anyone want to uh, ha add anything before we wrap up? Um, well, I, I just want to say that this kind of a, a gatherings are, are wonderful. I think it's great to exchange ideas and among us journalists and probably helping some of our audio, audience of journalists. And, and I don't know, I think we should connect, keep connected or all participants doing some of those collaborative stories. I really am seeing a lot of uh, potential um, of journalists working together in different issues from human rights to, you know, like energy, energy, sustainable energy. So here's my um, thank you for you. Well, thank you. Uh, I definitely agree about collaboration. Sorry, um, Imelda. 
No, I, I'm just saying that um, we should, uh, of course, humanize climate in human interaction if we want to, mm -hmm. if we want the world's um, attention. And another thing uh, is, that, is that sometimes people avoid uh, news negativity or the doom and gloom scenario. This is true solutions journalism, of course. So uh, I think Dave mentioned this already. Rather than um, reinforce this news fatigue, uh, solutions journalism focuses on um, shifting the balance of, by promoting forward-looking or rigorous coverage of responses to social problems such as um, climate change. So I think uh, we need to do more um, solutions um, journalism and um, impact stories. Yeah, more connectivity like this. I, I agree with both of you. The, uh, and ICFJ is the place to do it, uh, obviously. And uh, um, I mean, I, I just can't get enough of the Amazon story. And uh, I think it's just gonna become bigger and bigger and bigger for the whole world. I uh, look forward to seeing uh, uh, what everyone can do on it. Gustavo, good luck. Yeah. Well, great work. Let, let, let us know of, of the connections, how you can connect. Absolutely. Well, thank you all three of you so much for participating tonight. This has been incredibly interesting and your insights are really helpful. And I think um, there are a lot of great ideas uh, to follow up on for all of us who've listened tonight and or this morning for for our friend Imelda. <laughs> um, so um, thank you all who have tuned in to this discussion and um, we hope uh, everyone stays safe and keeps reporting on climate change and um, be sure to share your stories in the uh, ICFJ uh, Global Health Crisis Forum. Thank you all for joining us. Good night. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Bye. Take care. Bye.